the paper we're presenting today is called At the Head of the Table, the TRPG GM as Dramatistic Agent. I'm Bill White, and I'm here with my colleague, uh, Nick Miser. Uh, this paper uh, was also contributed to by our colleague, Nick Lalone, who isn't here, uh, but we'll, um, uh, we'll drive on. The, um, uh, the abstract sort of outlines uh, the method that we employed. We used communication scholar, rhetorician, Kenneth Burke's dramatistic approach to look at some moments of discourse, some moments in the TRPG fan discourse uh, uh, about the GM, right? because we think uh, the uh, GM is a concept that uh, gets a lot of attention, particularly in fan discourse, and, and it's got a, a, a big uh, penumbra around it of ideas, and we wanted to explore that uh, a little bit. And so, um, we started off our paper by talking about the history of the GM, history of the game master, talking about that uh, that that long tail or long shadow that hangs over the idea of the GM today. And so we we went back to the the roots in Kriegspiel and uh, other post-Napoleonic uh, military training exercises, and noticed that the idea that the games master or referee was an impartial arbiter was a core. Uh, part of this. And then as you get into um, uh, early fantasy miniatures battles and early D&D games, and this is the mid 20th century now, mid to late 20th century, uh, you have the sense of uh, adversarialness creeping in when the, the, the referee becomes a scenario designer who has to build in interest for, uh, uh, for themselves as well as for uh, other players. Uh, and then as uh, d d kind of sediments itself, uh, you, you have uh, variations and elaboration of role playing as a medium, as a form, uh, and, and the idea of GM as storyteller or dramaturge becomes more prominent beginning in the uh, 80s and particularly the 90s. And uh, the, um, uh, uh, with the dawn of the 21st century, you have uh, uh, different sort of scenes within role playing that kind of pursue different ways of looking at what it is that a GM does. And uh, our references are over there on the right, well, where we sort of point to major major places that you can go to sort of trace out this history that we're uh, that we're talking about. Uh, but that's that 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 history serves as the context, uh, sort of a rational reconstruction of what it is that we are um, what it is that we are placing our investigation against. Uh, and, but our data, the thing that we're looking at is these four different discursive moments about the GM. And they range in age from very recent, something we pulled off of Itch.io, a um, online uh, distribution platform, uh, talking about best practices for uh, GM and players, an old discussion uh, thread at the Forge, uh, from the first decade of this century, and then going back to um, an, in, an article from Interactive Fantasy in the 90s, and then an article from Different Worlds in the late 70s uh, uh, to, to sort of round this off. And, and the thing we want to say about all of these is that what links them is the sense that there are moments of taking role playing seriously. All of these places are uh, from the, the Twitter discourse to Different Worlds Magazine have been identified as places where role-playing games are taken seriously and they offer uh, uh, sites for thinking about what it is that we're doing when we role-play. And so uh, I've, I've advanced too far. Let me go back a little bit. Let me talk a little bit about Burke and then we'll get into each of those moments. And so this table is intended to sort of lay out what we're talking about when we talk about Kenneth Burke's dramatism. And, and, and the idea is at core, very simple. His idea is that, well, you know, when we're talking, when people uh, make utterances, when they say things to each other, you can look at the content as offering a vision of a world um, or a worldview that the speaker invites their audience to share. And the, the, the elements of that worldview are, are not terribly surprisingly the, the elements of, of describing what's going on, what's happening, who's there, and so forth. The, so he calls those agent, act, agency, scene, and purpose. Uh, and the thing that he notes, though, the thing that he um, uh, that Burke is interested in having us pay attention to is the way that different uh, emphases and 
uh, descriptions of the relationships between those elements establish patterns of cause and effect or of motivation and consequence for uh, how things work. And so when someone says something, what they're essentially saying is, this is how the world works. This is what's important. This is what drives action. This is what drives uh, 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 outcomes. And by, by highlighting either the uh, agent, for example, this is the kind of person who does this versus the scene, this uh, area or the circumstances demand this kind of response. We're pointing at different kinds of explanations for why things occur the way that they do. So th that's the essence of, of uh, the pentad. And it's what we use to look at each of these moments in order to see what they say. So for example, the first, uh, oops, I've gone backwards again. What I meant to do was move forward. And uh, so this is a table from our article where we summarize uh, from a Burkean or a pentatic or grammatistic perspective, what uh, the Shayas Galinas was saying when he was talking about how to be a good GM. And so um, I'll invite uh, uh, Nick uh, Miser to talk a little bit about what this is saying. Yeah, so with the Shayas Galinas, uh, what we find here is in some ways we, when, we, when uh, Bill walked through the history of game mastering a little bit, we were actually seeing this as kind of the opposite end of that adversarial relationship. Many of the things that had been present historically in this notion of GM are, are not present in Deshaies Galinas' uh, explanation of this. So rather than an adversarial relationship, this is the idea of GM as fan of the players and uh, the role of the game master as a facilitator of that. Although we could kind of intuit that in all of these cases, fun is an important goal that people are having. Deshaies Galinas is, I think, the only one uh, who emphasizes that and makes that an explicit purpose of what's going on. So the game master as a facilitator of fun, uh, helping to coordinate and bring together the player's ideas. And I think that it's really important to note that the, when we talk about scene, of course, the scene of the of the game master that Deshaies Galinas is, is talking about here that we show on our table is thinking about specifically as a game that's fun. But we can also zoom out and think about the, the scene in which Deshaies Galinas is is presenting this and uh, kind of thinking archaeologically in the as this as a, as in some ways a reaction to things that came before, um, really and in 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 context of of what's going on in gaming at this moment that we're looking at in 2022, it's important to note that Deshaies Galinas is operating in a context where in many role playing games there just isn't a game master at all anymore, and so the way that the game masters existence is, is justified, I think, becomes different uh, because these are, we're dealing with moments in, in gaming where people are saying like, oh, well, we don't need a game master to develop the scene. We can do that for ourselves. We've got all of these. So many, many of the historical functions have, have gone away and, and the, the, what's left is this coordination, this uh, uh, GMS facilitative fan, I think um, is really interesting. That is super interesting. Uh, yeah, so let's move forward. Uh, so we're going back to uh, 2004 and the, the Forge, a, a, a site where uh, people discussed how to design tabletop role-playing games and uh, you know, how, to, how to play them in a way that uh, got you what you wanted. And so uh, you can see here, uh, this is a thread where there's a discussion. Someone comes in and asks, how do I use these techniques? How do I use these tools, uh, uh, bangs and relationship maps in order to... In order to um, do this thing that you, you guys, you here at the Forge are saying is is uh, interesting or useful, and, and so you can see the, the the advice that he gets says, oh, as the GM, what you're doing is you're trying to drive the player characters towards making these fateful, um, important choices, uh, and that's how you're going to get story, and and so you see this this sort of emphasis on the particular the particular. Um, relationship between if you're trying to get story now, if you're trying to get premise addressed the way that fiction addresses premise, then uh, you have to play in a way, you, as a GM, you have to drive PCs towards these fateful choices. And that's that's the essence of what's happening here. And so, uh, um, uh, Nick, again, I, I just, I'm interested in your comments and thoughts on, on what we're seeing here as we move backward in time uh, towards the uh, towards the beginning of, of our history. 
Yeah, I think the thing that, that stands out to me in this moment is how systematic and structural the, the approach is. It's very like, it, it flows out of kind of the, the forge more generally as, as, a, as a gaming scene of this kind of very deliberate uh, systematizing this approach. And in, in, in terms of rec replicability, uh, I think that's really interesting thinking of GM. The GM also almost comes through as uh, a, a like a position that you can you can take training courses for or something like it's like it's very systematized in that way and it like uh, operationalizing things like bangs and the relationship map um, viewing the, the game master becomes someone who's like a master of these different sort of skill sets that um, that Marcus delineates here and that the forge kind of helps to to describe out so it's um professionalist isn't the right word but there's this kind of specialized uh, specialist sort of knowledge um that, that comes through i think in this I, I think it's cool i think that's true but let's move forward so now we go back uh, to before the uh 21st century into the 1990s uh interactive uh fantasy was a, a magazine that again took uh, took role playing seriously and here's a um uh, an article that's essentially a list of terms and games master is one of them and what what was interesting about this article is the um uh, the way that uh, the role of the GM was associated with a particular play style, particular agency, the notion of uh, being the adult in the room. You had to be the grown up because other players wouldn't. They might be children. They might they might be um, uh, uh, they might take other roles. But but the one thing that you you had to do as GM in order to uh, be uh, the 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 referee in order to ensure the kind of cooperative play style that uh, um, was desirable uh, was to be the adult in the room. And so I thought that was a really interesting uh, angle to, to take it. Nick, what are your thoughts? Yeah, it's, it's in some ways similar to the first moment in terms of the, the GM as fan and coordinator of things, but it has that, like you said, the, the adult in the room feel going on. And I think it's worth noting uh, my, my thought coming to throw in here is that I think that this is maybe in some ways the most persistent and lingering model out of many of the ones that we talk about that uh, and I, I mentioned that just to say that even though we're presenting these in kind of reverse chronology and in archaeology it's not that one supplants the other they like they, they remain extant people still pick up masters 1994 and read this and certainly the ideas kind of continue bouncing around. So these, all of these models exist side by side and continue influencing each other even after their their initial moment has faded. And I think you see that a lot with, with what Masters is talking about here. Yeah, I think that's very true. All right, so finally, the last moment is from Different Worlds Magazine, 1979, its first issue. Uh, and uh, here is a an article where uh, uh, the author tries to explain what is going on here uh, when we're doing all of this role playing, and uh, it's it's interesting to me the um, way in which uh, he the referee is described as someone who's who's in control. They they and and there there's a tension in what they're trying to do because they're trying to both. Uh, capture the mystery and adventure of a fantasy world, as well as get people to play and play right, you know, and threaten them and, and you know, motivate them to engage in the struggle to survive in this world. And it just seems like there's a, um, a, a sense of uh, absorption and complete engagement on the part of the GM that is different from what's going on uh, with players. Players are imagined as uh, people who have to be enlisted in uh, this this awe and wonder and mystery and uh, Nick, I'm interested in your thoughts. Yeah, it's I think it's really interesting at the reverse end where we be, we started by saying uh, this model of GM as fan of the players, and then we end with GM as referee, which is of course not the only place where we see that term, but it's strongest here, and that's that was this earlier term with these both being like kind of game based metaphors of trying to figure out where this person fits because in kind of the, there's this rediscovery of this like third party figure that came from Kriegspiel through Totten into the the Twin Cities gaming community uh, and the, they're trying to there a lot of it is trying to figure out who this person is and so it starts out as 
objective referee uh, kind of on the opposite end of like referee versus fan as these two like literal different positions. If you use a metaphor of like a football game or something like that, uh, that I think is, is really interesting in the way that they think about it. Yeah, the, um, the place that this brings us to is our sense of, of trying to make sense of all of these different moments and see. Uh, and if we look at these four different types, like these four different ideas, uh, the thing that we noticed uh, was this sense that, oh, on the, uh, uh, there's this, in terms of GM style, there's a sense that, oh, there's the adversarial versus the non-adversarial. And you see, the, uh, you see that um, uh, in, in the, the different articles that we looked at. But there's also this sense of uh, sort of a communication pattern differentiation in terms of monologue versus dialogue. And you can definitely see the idea that, oh, the GM is creating something that they're trying to share or trying to moderate or they're doing something um, and they're conveying it to uh, an audience of players versus the dialogic uh, in which you're they're trying to elicit some sort of uh, reaction from from the players and so we sort of mapped uh, those contingencies onto those four styles and, and and so I mean the one thing we can say is this is kind of the shape of the discourse space to a certain extent, there's also a historical patterning there, a move from monologic to dialogic because the, the demiurge and grown up are associated with the, the older articles and the, dia, uh, the challenger and fan are associated with more recent. Um, but, but we don't know that that's um, uh, like a, a real history rather than merely a, a rational reconstruction of one. Uh, Nick, your thoughts? Yeah, I think that's uh, you hit most of it. I think that to say that this is, we view this as sort of, an initial pass or sketch on this, that these are two relevant dimensions that have emerged out of the rhetoric. And we would expect like, as with further study, you're, we're gonna be identifying more and like doing more work on figuring out the relationship between what the, the overall discourse space and how that has changed over time uh, is something also that we'd, we'd expect to continue to develop as, as we continue to look through this. Terrific. So that's our talk. Uh, we'd love to um, uh, engage in questions and uh, as we continue our project, which is to look at different places and scenes and communities of, of practice within role-playing. And uh, so thank you for your time. We really appreciate it.